we don't come together to try and reduce the gap between the least healthy amongst us and try and move it more closely towards the, the healthiest of us, we're going to be in some difficult circumstances. We need to address those health inequities. If we don't do so, then our health care costs will continue to rise exponentially and our ability to provide adequate health services to our population is going to be threatened. What determines your health? Genetics? Doctors? Drugs? But what about the neighborhood you live in? Your job? The amount of money you earn? These are called the social determinants of health, and they can expose more than you think. Population health is a look at the health status of a community. Uh, you're looking at the socioeconomic determinants of health. You're looking at those things that produce health inequities, gaps in health status between segments of our community. Things like education, income, employment, housing, early child development. It's those things, those conditions in which we live that really produce the health status of our communities. When we look overall at the population of British Columbia and of Vancouver Coastal Health, we are a healthy population. However, if you go deeper, you will note that there are significant inequities in health status. So we have communities and neighborhoods within Vancouver Coastal Health where life expectancy is much shorter than in other communities, where there are higher rates of chronic diseases, where there, there's a higher prevalence of some of the risk factors we know will lead to chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. North Vancouver is surrounded by incredible natural beauty. But beneath the surface lies another story. It's got a population of about 180,000 people in total. It's a very well-to-do community. It's very well off. There's a high level of average family and median family income on the North Shore. That, from time to time, is problematic because what happens is those people who do live on the margins of our community are often not visible. They're not well known. But people still living here in poverty and there are still homeless people here and there's still people who live on the margins. Income is a major social determinant of health. Elise, a single mother, knows what it's like to struggle to make ends meet. Financial worry was the biggest cause of a negative dynamic between me and my son. If he loses his, his jacket at school, there's a, a lot more stress around him losing his jacket. And you dump that onto your child. And then you feel guilty about it, and then you get sick to your stomach. Because you just bought him a new jacket. Even if you got it at the Salvation Army for 15 bucks, you have to go out and buy another one. And you don't have a car to get your child home. You know, economics really, really plays a huge role in, you know, healthy dynamics between parents and their kids. Elise's income determines the kind of housing she is able to afford. I worked in the fishing industry for about 12 years. And then after the fishing industry closed down in 94, um, I worked in tourism and the job started at 850 an hour. I was living from basement suite to basement suite, which was really unhealthy because almost everyone had no fire exit and mold on the walls. If it wasn't for the housing here, I don't know what I would have done because it, you pay 30% of your income here. But still, you have the additional costs of, of food, um, uh, transportation. Elise's son, a high school graduate, is planning to move out on his own. This change will drastically affect her housing. That's going to be an, an adjustment for me, because when he moves out, I lose my housing. Um, I will have to be living on the same income that I am and going out and trying to find a, a roof over my head for market rent. I don't know where I'd move for a one bedroom, for let's say a one bedroom basement is about $750 a month and that would be about 70% of my income right now, so. John is now at the bottom of the economic ladder. A few years ago, he suffered a heart attack. Then came some bad news about his job. You know, two years ago I was working as an accountant for construction company, making $55,000 a year, doing okay. When I lost my job, I had dollars in RSPs. My credit cards were paid up to date, not 
just paid up to date. They were clear. Two years later, it's all gone. With savings depleted, no job, and his health worsening, John was forced to stay at a homeless shelter. For a lot of people, you go into the shelter for a period of time. You're getting fed, you're getting housed, and you're getting, let's say you're getting welfare, and you have to leave the shelter. Two thirds of what you're allotted goes to housing. In North Vancouver, you're not going to get housing for that money. So how exactly does a person's income level affect their health status? So as we've talked about this uh, gradient in health status, this is reflected in many of the chronic diseases that we see uh, today. So for instance, people in the lower socioeconomic groups will have higher prevalence of things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and the like. So there is this social gradient with respect to the chronic diseases and those with the highest levels of income have the lowest levels of these diseases. And the lower your income, the higher your risk. And similarly using the latter, it's not surprising to, to learn that self-rated health status, that is an individual's own reflection on their health status, follows the same gradient. Those in the lowest socioeconomic uh, category will say that they have poor health status and that health is a problem for them. And similarly, that gradient reflects itself up the rungs of the ladder. The closer you get to the top of the uh, income group, the more likely you are to report that your health status is good. Peter and Elizabeth both have successful careers. Peter is the CEO of his own company and Elizabeth works for a foreign investment bank. They enjoy a good income and a healthy lifestyle. I've got good health. Um... Like Elspeth, I, I need to have more of a regular exercise uh, program. But Elspeth has been making her smoothie <laughs> special every morning. Uh, <laughs> and in that, she puts all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wonder what all she's feeding me. <laughs> but but it, it's indicative of greater awareness of what we're feeding our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, things like that go a long way to providing better health. Higher income can make healthy recreation more accessible, such as their club memberships. And behind me is Deep Cove and the Yacht Club, Deep Cove Yacht Club. There is a recreational activity for canoeing and kayaking. And the kayaking is very good. You can go up what is called Indian Arm, which goes up this way for about 20 kilometers. And at the end of that 20 kilometers is a facility of the Yacht Club, which we call the Outstation, and in the wilderness. It's just a beautiful location. And limited income means limited choices. When you're in the situation that I'm in right now, put your hand in your pocket, you've got seven bucks. Okay, what's this for? Well, I'd like to go to a movie. Too bad. It's 11 bucks. So you... Put the seven bucks back in your pocket, back to the shelter, watch TV, read a book, carry on. Dr. Patty Daly believes that these problems can be tackled in a more cost-effective manner with intervention at an earlier age. One of the most important determinants of health is early childhood development. Early childhood development is like an immunization program against mental health and addictions and many of the other important health conditions that we can see later in life. Access to key services at childhood can produce dramatic benefits later in life. Things like access to quality daycare, things like access to libraries and community centers that have programs for children, things like ensuring that there's access to healthy nutritious food for children so that they don't go hungry. Some of these initiatives, we know, can start to address those vulnerabilities we see in that early childhood period. But the lack of these services often foreshadows future problems. I had to work a 12-hour night shift when I was seven months pregnant. And that wasn't easy, working in an immersion freezer in the freezing cold from seven at night to seven in the morning when I was seven months pregnant, because I really needed the money. <laughs> And then after Graham was born, it was literally impossible to find childcare that would take him at 6.30 in the morning. There was a while there I left him with a neighbor and that I didn't know very well because it was the only option for me. And I really felt 
you know, if you don't know the people very well and they're not licensed, you're putting your child at risk. Physical activity for children can also determine their future health. What it did, their involvement in uh, soccer, both of them, it, um, it kept them off the street and out of the malls. They didn't have time for that sort of thing. And so if you ask me, you know, did they turn out, they both turned out to be very decent adults who are capable of uh, leading their own lives. One of them is married and has his own family. And uh, that's, that's basically the main thing that you want to give to your children is that they're able to manage life. <laughs> mm -hmm. He would have loved to have participated in hockey, but hockey, you need a vehicle. Even soccer, you need a vehicle to go around to all the soccer games. Um, it just kind of got embarrassing, begging for rides, you know, all the time. So we actually participated in one sport, which was GSL football, uh, because it was always at the same field. It's, it's accessible on the bus, and it was quite cheap. But he would have loved to have played hockey, and he never got an opportunity to do that. The Turners see the advantage of Elizabeth's health plan. Oh, I would say definitely. My, my job uh, provides for extended health benefits, which uh, is something that when you're self-employed, it's, it's not as easy to get. And uh, that definitely has helped our family. Definitely. Without health insurance, Elise and John have few options. I had um, a really bad toothache. I experienced that a couple of years ago, and I have never felt such pain. And I had to opt for the tooth being pulled rather than the root canal because it was a difference of $200 versus $2,000. My monthly drug bill was around $330. This little baby is $107. Lasts for 30 days. I was paying for those drugs every month out of my pocket. It's one of the reasons why the credit card bills were cranked. Our lives are shaped by the conditions in which we are born, work, and age. While our differences in health status are hardly fair, they are avoidable. Already, the health system is largely unaffordable. It's becoming quite unsustainable. And people who are less healthy, those who live in the lower socioeconomic groups, are significant contributors to health system costs. We know that if we were to address much of their circumstances in terms of housing and nutrition and things like that, it would be a cheaper option than to go on trying to deal with them in the health system itself. I think what's important to emphasize is that we can't do this alone. Those of us working in the health sector play only a small role, and we need to work with other partners in government, those who work in non-governmental organizations, those who work in the community. How do we create, sustain, and maintain health in the citizens who live in our community? Not just how we make them better when they get sick. We need to sit down and really think about the strategies that we need to bring into play, the policy decisions that we need to make in order to ensure that all of our citizens have equal access to opportunity, lifelong achievement, and productivity. I'm not looking for the Ritz. I just, uh, I like somewhere where you got your own bathroom, you got uh, your own bedroom, somewhere to cook, and not that big that you can clean it. I live within my means of the time, and uh, continue to do so. So my means are minimal, so my expectations have to be minimal. The challenges we face with health inequities seem daunting, yet the answers to solve these problems are now clearly within our reach, but it relies on our ability to work together. <laughs>